Greetings, Bat Family. Welcome back to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. Make sure you visit our website, holybatcast.com. Uh, it's your one stop shop for all things Holy Batcast. You can also find us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Search for Holy Batcast, you'll find us. If you love the show, you want to help support us, you can do that on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash holybatcast. Uh, and thank you to all our patrons. You guys are amazing. Love you. Give you hugs. You're amazing. But we got two new patrons. So uh, first we have Mr. William Horton. Uh, and then we also have Aaron Cajanto. So William and Aaron, thank you guys so much. That is wonderful. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, so yes, big big thank you to Aaron and William, and big thank you to everybody who is a patron. You guys keep the thing running. You keep it going, and it means a lot to us that you do that just out of the kindness of your heart. So big old thank you. So William Horton, Aaron Cajanto, you guys are superstars. Pat yourselves on the back. Feel good about yourselves because I feel good good about you thank you for that um what else we're part of the real fans podcast network check out all those shows at rf4rm.com uh and that includes we've been working on the the rf uh for rm site a little bit and i finally got grim grinny hosts up there thank god hunter's show and then fan fatales the 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 new show so uh check those out at rf4rm.com as always, I'm Andy DiGenova. You can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. It's just my name, Andy DiGenova. On this episode, we're going to do another little news roundup. We got some fun things to talk about. A little bit of Wonder Woman, a little bit of Flash, and a little bit of Batman. And we are going to review the next episode of Batman Beyond. Joining me for all this, it's my bat brother, Mr. Jamie Drewley. Hey, Jamie. Greetings from Hoth. Ah, uh, it's that time of year. Uh, it's single digit temperatures all week, but yesterday it got to 30 and we were all talking about a heat wave. Nice. That's sad state of affairs, but welcome to the Midwest in winter, you know? I, I don't miss it. I'll tell you that. I sure don't. I, I repeatedly tell my wife, you know how much I love you because I would have gone south years ago if not for you. It's not too late. I, I love her more than I love being warm. I remind her of this constantly. <laughs> well, that's, there's something to be said for that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, my uh, you know my family came for Christmas. They came down here to Florida, and my brother because they want to get the hell out of this weather too. I can appreciate it. Well, yeah, you, you didn't invite me for Christmas. That's why I didn't. Come. I mean, you're well, you're welcome, but we the house was full. Um, I, I was waiting for Uncle Jesse to walk in the door because it was such a full house. Heyo. Uh, but anyway, I was talking to my brother-in-law. I was like, oh, man, it was so great having you here. We, we had a lot of fun. He goes, yeah, and I noticed that like I just felt better down there, so maybe it's time. I was like, hell yeah, come on down. The more people who come, the less I have to go elsewhere. So right. it would be nice, but you know, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, but anyway, got some DC stuff. And, and as always, you don't know what I pulled up. No, I so have no idea. A little surprise. The only thing I can tell you for certain is I like Batman. That is an important note. And uh, thank you for sharing that with the class. And we're back on our normal recording schedule. So sayonara, Brendan. It was fun while it lasted. Well, you know, I, I put it to him in, in the perspective. You know, I, I said when we, I was available to record, and Andy's like, yeah, we'll just do it at the regular time. And Brendan's oh, I can just go to hell, right? I was like, well... That depends. We can pretty much do it whenever you want, but it also depends on how much live NFL game commentary you want in the middle of the episode. <laughs> I'm, you know, this is the last week of the regular season. Playoffs start next week, so I'm, I'm going to get real funny about that football stuff here Invested. over the course of the next month. Yeah, I especially mean, since if the Raiders beat the Chargers tonight, we go to the playoffs. Winner goes to the playoffs, loser stays home. So, so if they game. lose, if they lose, then your your schedule frees up again. Well, I still watch the rest of the playoffs. But, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Well, I'd much it. rather, I mean, it's been a long time since I could say I watched a Raiders playoff game, and it's been even longer since I could say we won one, so. Okay. Uh, all right, well, here we go. You ready? First thing is is probably one that you're super interested in, and that's why I pulled it up first. Uh, awesome. pe people have seen The Peacemaker. Okay. And we got some reviews of Peacemaker. So here we go. 
Here's what the uh, folks have to say. And these aren't these aren't bloggers. These are like legit reviews from legit publications. Uh, so here's the uh, the review from The Hollywood Reporter. And these are just excerpts, obviously. Uh, I got to give a thank you to BatmanNews.com because that's where I'm pulling these excerpts for, from. So they did the work and pulled the excerpts. I'm just reading them. So thanks, Batman News. Uh, this one's from The Hollywood Reporter. It says, for all the show's feints towards edginess, it colors well within the lines laid out by its predecessors. That's not entirely to its detriment. It makes Peacemaker a comfort rather than a challenge. Too much familiarity over the course of a season, however, leads to a series that's easily not to mind watching instead of one that's hard to quit watching. In its quest to shed new light on a character who came out of his last movie looking dangerously close to outright villainy, Peacemaker loses too much of the darkness that made him compelling in the first place. I mean, that I, sounds very lukewarm. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I like the um, you don't mind watching it, not that you, not that you can't quit watching it, which is honestly how I felt about this show. The whole thing is, oh yeah, I'll watch it. I don't mind watching it, but I'm not, you know, super excited. But yeah. Um, TV Line says, as part of whatever DC is calling its extended movie and TV universe these days, Peacemaker also isn't shy about directing some of its barbs at its world's top shelf heroes, as Chris regularly dishes embarrassing dirt on the likes of Aquaman, Superman, and Batman, at least based on what Google has told him. Those wink winks, though, don't compare to the genuine comedy generated by larger team debates about, say, which Rivendale, Riverdale kids can't be pinned for an episode one murder and which enjoy extended cuts in end credits excerpts. What? <laughs> I didn't quite follow that. I think it makes more sense if you've seen it. Probably. I guess what they're saying is it's funny and they make a lot of uh, jokes at other superheroes expense as well as random pop culture like Riverdale. I, the which Riverdale is, thing is kind of bizarre, but I mean, the... The superhero pot shots thing. I mean, I'm in the comedic realm of the superhero world. That seems perfectly at home to me. Well, and it makes sense for Peacemaker. And I, there was a, I don't know if it was a clip or another trailer or something that had some of that in it. So yeah, you know, he's if if you're going to use a character to poke fun at the rest of the DC universe, I could see Peacemaker working for that. And you know, I've never seen the Deadpool movies because reasons, but from all of the stuff that I've caught from conversations happening around me, it sounds like that was a a pretty recurring theme in those movies as well so yeah um next one's from rolling stone it says between the blood and guts the slapstick the political satire and the musical digressions there's a lot going on here yet the series functions as a sincere character study of its flawed hero and the unfortunate souls who have to work alongside him just enough for the joke to never quite wear thin even in a wildly oversaturated market for tales of hypermuscular men and women punching their way to justice, Peacemaker stands out. You'll want to taste it, even the parts that are incredibly bad taste. So they seem to really like it. That's good. That kind of falls in line with exactly what I was expecting from the show, but that's also what a lot of people were saying similar tonally in that review from what they were saying about the Suicide Squad before I watched it, and... Uh, that, that didn't turn out so good for me, but you know, for people who love the suicide squad, this sounds like it's probably in line with that. So, you know, good for them. I definitely feel like however you felt about James Gunn's, the suicide squad is how you're going to feel about this. So my hunch is you're not going to like it. My hunch is that I will, will be like, Oh, it's fine. You know? <laughs> and then well, for people who loved it, my guess is they'll love this. I, I would say that's probably, you know, fairly accurate. You know, like the, the Harley Quinn series, I, as an example, the animated series. I wasn't looking forward to that at all. Like all the, the trailers and, and information just indicated to me it was just going to be overkill to my senses and I wasn't going to like it. And I really like that show a lot. In fact, I dare say I love that show. So yeah, you, you, you never know what will turn out, which is why I want to judge it on its own merits instead of saying, oh, great, a continuation of this movie that I couldn't stand. Right. And. Just a, a sidebar to it real quick. Uh, HBO Max recently added the uh, the newest iteration of the show Wipeout. Have you ever watched Wipeout? Like the one with, with the big with courses the and stuff? Courses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So John Cena is hosting a a, a new thing of Wipeout. And my, my family and I love Wipeout, especially me and my son. We just, it's got that juvenile humor where somebody, you know, hits face first into something and then their legs bend over the top of their head and then they go tumbling into the water and we just laugh hysterically because mm -hmm. it's funny because we're sick human beings laughing at others suffering. But, uh, Cena, his commentary on that show and you know, who knows if he's writing it himself or whatever, but he's doing a really good job with it. 
Yeah. Like his 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 comedy is, you know, it's silly, but it it works for the most part. So I'm I'm kind of hoping I get more of that than you know the Suicide Squad in this film. Okay. Uh, Joe Blow says James Gunn is a brilliant madman. Even before Guardians of the Galaxy, his work on Slither and Super showcased his genre sensibilities and made him the the ideal person to direct comic book tales of misfits and off-kilter characters just outside the mainstream. With The Suicide Squad, Gunn delivered a mature, bloody, and profane epic that introduced many new characters to the DCEU. While I wasn't completely in love with The Suicide Squad, I was instantly a fan of John Cena as Peacemaker, and I've been looking forward to his HBO Max solo series since it was announced. I'm very happy to say that not only is Peacemaker a hilariously brilliant and subversive superhero story, but to potentially Potentially the best work of James Gunn's career. Hmm. Does it say who wrote that for Joe Blow? Or? Uh, no, it does not. Okay, not important. But... Uh, but, I mean, there's someone who wasn't in love with the Suicide Squad, but did love this, so that's something. And then finally, from Yahoo, it says, even if Peacemaker was irredeemable crap, it would still be worth tuning into for its opening credits. <laughs> Uh, it says, but to be clear, Peacemaker is not irredeemable, irredeemable crap, though its biggest hurdle is how it feels a bit like an afterthought, the spinoff that no one asked for rather than a bold new story. However, thanks to the strength of the ensemble, along with some of the wildest action scenes seen in recent memory, the series does deliver a lot of joy, along with the continued reminder that as Gunn's work as a storyteller continues to mature, it gets better and better. It's not just that this is a great ensemble of actors, it's that Gunn knows how to let them shine. Okay. All right, fair it enough. It sounds like these are these are taken in stride. It's not like it's the greatest thing ever reviews, which sometimes get me a little you know, I I honestly think Spider Man No Way Home suffered from a little bit bit of that from me because everybody's saying greatest thing ever or thereabouts and I of course, went in with a little bit more of a critical eye than I probably should have due to that reason. Yeah. So anyway, I'm 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 glad that people are being realistic about this instead of like overly hyperbolic with it. it. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think that was nice is that these reviews just feel a little more measured and in the pros and cons, which it's e- then it's easier to get, to give them some uh, weight and some credence because you're like, oh, you know, it seems like they are being reasonable about it. So uh, the first three episodes of Peacemaker uh, drop in just a few days on January 13th. That is right around the corner, isn't it? Yep, and then the remaining episodes will be released weekly after that. So coming right up. Interesting. We'll check it out. So Peacemaker is coming soon. Uh, Someone who we might have to wait a little bit longer for is Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 3. So Gal Gadot uh, was doing an interview with In Style, and she was asked about Wonder Woman 3, and she said, well, we're developing the script right now, and we'll probably start shooting in a year and a half or so. Yay. So so we're, we're three years to four years away from that movie. Uh, so that means that they would probably start filming in the middle of 2023, which means it probably wouldn't come out till 2024. Yeah, so that's what uh, that'd be a four year gap because Wonder Woman 1984 came out in 2020, late 2020, but it came out. So that's the best guess. Um, But it's nice to hear it's at least being worked on. It's nice to hear it's coming and (laughs) the time flies. Right. I remember uh, like we talked about in the last episode, I remember when Aquaman wrapped and they're like, all right, Aquaman 2 is uh, slated for 2022. And I was like, shit, that's four years. It's going to be forever. It's now this year, less than a year away from Aquaman 2. I mean, I'd, I'd say I was kind of disheartened that it was that long, but you'd rather have the quality product than the hurried product, right? Yep. So it, it, the, the big question was, though, when, uh, when the news came out that uh, Patty Jenkins' Rogue Squadron was on indefinite hold, that it was like, oh, is Wonder Woman 3 going to be on the fast track? And it sounds like maybe that's not the case. It will not be fast tracks. They're still taking their time with it. But we shall see. Again, that's just the, the best guess based on her comment in an interview. Things, of course, can happen quicker. They can take longer. It just depends on how the script comes together and how happy they are with it, as well as her schedule and Patty's schedule. 
And how many kids Gal has between now and then? Oh my God, ain't that the truth? <laughs> Listen, I mean, I, I ain't even mad at that because if I was married to Gal Gadot, we'd have a lot of kids too. I'm just saying. <laughs> got it um so yeah it's gonna be a while before we see wonder woman in her own solo film but we may not have to wait very long to see gal gadot back as a wonder woman oh yeah so on new year's eve gal posted on instagram Do you ever see those things on instagram where it's like my year in review oh I don't have Instagram. Okay, well, uh, it also, you know, people people will share it elsewhere too. But yeah, they'll be like, oh, my year in review or, you know, another one that I see from some friends where they do like one second every day for the month. Uh, and so she did that. And in there, you have to look for it, but they go kind of month by month, by month by month. And then there are photos of hers from those months. Uh so uh, her caption was, 2021 has been a challenging year for all of us, but also full of many great and exciting moments. I'm forever grateful. 2022, I'm ready for you. But in there, there are two shots of Gal. One where she is just getting her makeup done for some sort of production. And another one where she is also getting made up, but she is very clearly in her Wonder Woman outfit. So that, so that means she shot something in 2021 as Wonder Woman. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out where that's probably going to wind up, right? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there are options, but the most likely candidate would be, I mean, you. what do you think? The Batgirl movie. Obviously, okay. I, I think it was the Peacemaker series. <laughs> yeah, Peacemaker, definitely. <laughs> No, I mean, Flash, right? I yeah, mean, that, I mean... That's where everybody's head goes immediately. Though, yeah, right? the Flash feels like the most obvious choice, uh, especially because in these photos, uh, one of the makeup guys, he's wearing a red and yellow lanyard. So... Maybe he's a Chiefs fan, you don't know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it could be the Flash, it could be Aquaman 2, it could be Shazam. Um, but... Smart money's on the Flash, especially what we know about that film, and uh, you know, not as we said, not just a DC movie, or excuse me, not just a Flash movie, but a DC movie in general. I mean, I wouldn't even be mad at her showing up in the Flash either, or not the Flash, the Shazam movie either. But I, my money's on Flash, obviously. Yeah, that it seems like the safest bet. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, now they mention it, red and yellow is also Shazam. <laughs> So that's cool. I'm excited about that. We'll see how that uh, how how that proceeds. But anyway, uh, the the photo of her in the Wonder Woman outfit is from August. So take that as you will. I mean, either one of those movies would have been filming in August, I would think. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to remember when Flash said it wrapped, but I can't remember. And just because it wrapped doesn't mean she's not going in and doing post stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it could be part of reshoots or I mean, who knows. So. Think, think about what Richard told us about the nightmare sequence in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Virtually none of those people were on stage at the same time together, right? So. Yep. All right. Well, we shall see. But that's that's great to see. I do like the little pop-ins, cameos, things like that. And I'll always take more of Gal as Wonder Woman. I think most of us would. So maybe we'll see her in The Flash. Maybe, maybe she filmed a Walmart commercial. I don't know. I mean, possibilities are endless. Um, do you know who we're going to see in The Flash, though? Michael uh, Keaton. Michael Keaton. Michael yeah. Keaton. So Michael Keaton said yes to The Flash, but way back when, you know what he said no to? No. He said no to Batman Forever. He was like, no thanks, I'm out. And he recently talked about it. Talked about this on the Backstage Podcast, and he talked about his meetings with Joel Schumacher to discuss being in Batman Forever and why he decided to walk away. He's mentioned this in the past. I remember one time he very flippantly just said, yeah, I, I read the script. It sucked. Like, I, it was something very simple like that in the past, uh, but this time he goes into a little more detail. He says, uh, it was always Bruce Wayne. It was never Batman. Uh, this is what he said about how he viewed the character. He said, to me, I know the name of the movie is Batman, 
It's hugely iconic. It's a very cool and cultural iconic, and because of Tim Burton, also artistically iconic. But I knew from the get-go it was Bruce Wayne. That was the secret. I never talked about it. Everyone would say, Batman, Batman, Batman does this. And I kept thinking to myself, no, you're thinking about it wrong. It's all about Bruce Wayne. What kind of person does that? Who becomes that? And then when the director who directed the third one, I said, I just can't do it. And one of the reasons I couldn't do it was, and you know, he's a nice enough man, he's passed away, so I wouldn't speak ill of him, even if he were alive. He, at one point, after more than a couple of meetings, where I kept trying to rationalize doing it, and hopefully talking him into saying, I think we won't go in this direction, I think we should go in this direction, and he wasn't going to budge. But I remember one of the things that I walked away going, oh boy, I can't do this, he asked me, I don't understand why everything has to be so dark and everything so sad. And I went, wait a minute, do you know how this guy got to be Batman? Have you read? I mean, it's pretty simple. And there you have it. Hmm. But I remember, you know, I've, I've, there, there are the stories of, of Joel Schumacher who, again, he said, you know, he says himself, Joel Schumacher was a sweetheart of a human being. Uh, even you know, even if I don't like his Batman movies, I think he was wonderful, and I would love to hang out with him. And I'm wishing him the best in the afterlife. Um, I but mean, the, the Batman movies aside, that guy was a hell of a filmmaker. Yeah, he absolutely, made some really good. Like he's made my favorite vampire movie of all time. Yeah, absolutely. So. But there were quotes of him saying of being like, "Enough with the dead parents," <laughs> you know, like "Enough with sad Batman." And so like. That was his take, and, you know, he wanted to make a Saturday morning cartoon, and uh, it works better for some people than it does others, but, yeah, this that wasn't something that that Keaton was, was into, but what I do think is interesting is how he said, I kept trying to rationalize doing it, which of course he did, because I think the story was he was offered $35 million to do it, which is an insane payday. That's hard to turn down for any reason. Yeah. Um, but he still he still just couldn't bring himself to do it. So it's interesting. And it is I, I do wonder the timeline of how many meetings they had, how long it took for him to decide to walk away, uh, because there's also something I don't know if you've ever seen them. But there there are photos out there of them building the Batman Forever suit on top of a Michael Keaton body sculpt. I mean, if, if everybody had to assume he was going to do it. Right? Yeah. If nothing else for the massive payday. Yeah. So anyway, we all, you know, we know that Joel was brought in to make a fun, kid-friendly one. That's what he was doing. And that just wasn't in line with how Michael Keaton saw the character. So we all get it. I just, I just appreciate if, you know, that he turned down that much money because he's like, this is not what I want to do. There's something to be said for integrity. And the man's obviously loaded to the gills with integrity. Yeah. And I, I know that, the two Keaton Batman films, particularly Returns, they say they're not very kid friendly and they're they're too dark and all that other stuff. And all I can think to myself was, you ever watch any kids products from the seventies or eighties? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's some stuff going on in there. I mean, Old Yeller, Return to Oz. I mean, <laughs> don't don't act like we kids were coddled to the point where we never saw a scary image on a screen. One Magic Christmas. Oh Jesus. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it is true and I I think it was just when you think about it, like the kids weren't the ones who had the problems with the movies. It was the overprotective adults. Fair point. You know, like except for that one random kid in the video that makes the rounds every once in a while, the the random kid who was like on a talk show talking about how scared he was during Batman Returns, which is hysterical if you've never seen it. Um aside from that, I feel like the the backlash was from parents, not kids. Kids were fine. Yeah, it, we don't give kids enough credit when it comes to scary stuff. No, no, we don't. Uh, it's, I mean, kids aren't dumb. Yeah, and I'm not talking no. like horror movie, you know. But like, no, I mean, no. yeah, look at look at freaking Pinocchio. There's some terrifying stuff in that movie, but it's great. Oh, yeah, I saw Pinocchio at the theater with my grandfather when I was probably I don't know maybe nine or ten at some kind of a re-release, and that that was some pretty you know I. I had a pretty weak constitution back then because I, w- I was shielded from all the the horror stuff and everything else when I was a kid because my parents couldn't stand it. But uh, it, there were some uneasy moments in that movie for me back at that age. So, Yeah. Well, I mean, Walt Disney said that once. He said, like, yeah, you, you need darkness 
in a movie you know you need you can't have the light without the dark something to that effect so but anyway history had other plans michael keaton walked away from batman forever and joel schumacher made brendan's favorite movie I remember when Kilmer got the part, I thought to myself, oh, this is exciting. He's he's bigger in stature than Keaton, which, of course, I was obsessed with the size of superhero people back then. And, you know, I, I saw Kilmer in that part. And, you know, the, especially that moment where, you know, uh, Dick tells him, you know, I'm going to go do this and you can't stop me. And he stands up and just kind of forebodingly looks over him and goes, I can stop you. Yeah. Like, say what you will about that movie. I love that moment. I think it's a great Batman moment. And. Kilmer, whatever you want to say about his part in this Batman world or anything else, I think he had the potential to be an incredible Batman, and we just didn't get tapped into it because of what was around him in that movie, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I remember being so depressed, even then, when it was announced that Michael Keaton wasn't coming back. Like, I was so bummed out. But anyway... That's the way it went, but it w- turns out it wasn't the last we see of uh, Michael Keaton as Batman. We just had to wait a lot of years. What, 26? 20, 26 years? No, 27 by the time The Flash comes out. So The Flash is coming out, and there was a bit of a hubbub online last week about The Flash with some rumors about the film. Oh, I can't wait for this. Yeah, and we mentioned it briefly in our year-end wrap-up. And uh, the more I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, we should address it. But it's one of those things where it's like, I want to talk about it, but I also don't want to talk about it. Which, honestly, I kind of encapsulates how I feel about DC films in general. <laughs> I love talking about it, and I hate talking about it. It um, is a, quite the double-edged sword. Oh, my God. Days. It's right. You don't know suffering until you were a DC fan. But at least you get to to miss a lot of the drama because you're not on Twitter anymore. And that's smart. I mean, everybody out there wondering why I'm not on social media. Just think of me as Cypher in the Matrix eating that delicious looking steak going ignorance is bliss because that's really what I'm doing these days. No, I don't blame you. Um, So there were some rumors that came out about The Flash and uh, they came from a couple of places. One came from a, a leaker on Twitter uh, called My Time to Shine Hello, who I've never heard of. Uh, so I have no idea. But maybe the other, he writes for We Got This Covered. Maybe. But the other one came from uh, the infamous Grace Randolph. You'll pardon me if I don't take anything she says at face value. So uh, My Time to Shine says that the movie... En- oh, it says... Uh, Supergirl is now the main soups of Earth. Keaton is Batman and Batgirl will become the new Batman after her film. And it says the movie ends with the Flash, Supergirl and Shazam forming a new Justice League. And then Grace Randolph says, as I've told you with update, the Flash, Batflex final appearance and with old footage of Cavill used on a TV. New Justice League formed. Supergirl is the new Superman Keaton working with Black Canary and picks Batgirl as the new Batman. This is the new DC. Let's be open-minded and give it a fair shot. Now, uh, one other quick thing to note before we say anything is David Sandberg, the director of Shazam and Shazam 2, he tweeted uh, very tongue-in-cheek as he does, uh, Shazam is joining the Justice League? 2022 is starting out with some great news. And then he used the... uh, the meme of everything's coming up Millhouse, and it says everything's coming up Batson. <laughs> uh, and then some, works great. He's... And, and someone asked like, oh, wait, is this true? And he goes, I have not watched or read the script for The Flash, so I guess anything could happen as far as I know. I mean, that's not a denial, denial or a confirmation, so. Uh, and it's not like the the execs would be like, oh, we have to keep him in the loop about what we're going to use this character for, I guess. Hell, I don't know. I mean, I would think he would be given the heads up. But, so, uh, yeah, what are... And maybe he was, and he's just playing coy about it. We it, don't know. It's possible, but what are your thoughts on this? Well, first things first, uh, pat me on the back, because I believe I, whenever it was announced, said that they're opening a door for Supergirl to replace Superman in case they can't get Cavill back. 
somebody check the tape. I don't know what episode or anything else it was, but I said that way back when. Okay. But uh, I, I don't have a problem with it if that's what they're going to do. I mean, we're, we're expecting big changes out of this movie, right? This has always been the, since, you know, the, the first director was attached to this movie, it's always been assumed this was going to be a reset button for the universe, right? So I don't know why any of this would come to, as a surprise if it's accurate. The two stories seem to kind of line up with one another well enough that you can say where there's smoke, there's fire. But who knows if their information isn't coming from the same source and it's inaccurate. I I, I don't know. I, if you're going to have Supergirl, Batgirl, Shazam, Wonder Woman, if, if that's your new Justice League, Aquaman, I don't have a problem with this. This It's fine with me. One thing I, for- I, I, am, I am curious to see what exactly Batgirl is going to do in that movie that's going to automatically elevate her to the level of global defender. That's got me really excited for what's going to happen in Batgirl. But uh, I, I, I'm fine with it if that's what it is. But, you know, let's let's, let's wait and see before we all lose our minds. Right. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that it, Grace, it, it was it, it, I don't remember if it was a tweet before or after. I don't have it in front of me, but she here's what really led to an uproar is she said, Oh, it's going to erase the Snyderverse," And because she used the word erase that caused a lot of drama with the Snyder fans. Um, and so someone actually asked Ezra Miller about it and he's on, he's on Instagram. He's not on Twitter. Um, and he did respond. He said, no power or force in any known megaverse would or could ever erase Zack Snyder's mighty works. You can take that quote, take it to the bank, to the press, to the schools, to the military, uh, and the other pillar of capitalism I'm forgetting because of that thing where if you try to think of a group of things, you always forget one of them. Well, I mean, if it does happen, let's let's wait and see exactly how it does happen, because at this point we can stand on the ground that Snyder basically had a trilogy of movies that, you know, divisive as they may be, have a very strong following that very many of us, you and I included, are are completely in love with. So, I mean, unless they just, you know, hit a reset button in such a way that deliberately goes out of the way to piss on that, then erasing it is is a little bit of a strong term again i say a reset button but these movies exist it's not like they're taking these movies away from us it's not like this flash movie is going to happen and they're going to pull all these other movies off of streaming services and store shelves and everything else there was a very funny uh meme i guess or or tweet that i don't even remember who did it but i i retweeted it where it was like oh man i'm really i'm really afraid for november of 22 when my copies of man of steel bvs and justice league just burn up on my shelf because the flash erases them yeah (laughs) so Uh, i mean is is it disappointing that we won't get a a more direct continuation of Zack Snyder's story sure but you know, possibilities are endless in what's called a multiverse, right? I mean, eventually we, we may get some kind of a continuation out of that. We, we don't, we simply don't know, but as far as this movie, let's all, let's all not lose our minds about this movie because somebody said in maybe incorrect terminology that these other movies no longer play a factor in it because I mean, it sounds like they're, they're keeping at least a couple of the people that came out of that, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. It's pe- people love to be mad on the internet. I know that much. So I feel very similar to you in a lot of ways on this, because here's the big thing. We knew the flash was going to clean up the timeline and set the new status quo for DC on film. We knew that the whole point of it we knew that's why you've got ben affleck's batman and michael keaton's batman in the film that's why we knew it was going to clean things up and set the table for how it's going to be moving forward we knew supergirl was in it we know that we knew when they announced michael keaton the the strong rumor at that point and it has not changed is that after the flash michael keaton will be the new in continuity batman And so that way, Robert Pattinson's Batman can live off on his own universe and they can do whatever they want with those films. We knew these things. But because someone chose to use the word erase, 
that is what's causing, I think, the overreaction. But if he, they were truly going to erase the Snyderverse, if they were truly going to say, you know, those don't count anymore, do we really think Ben Affleck would have agreed to do it? Do we really the, think this is how he would choose? Anybody. I mean, they, would they have kept Ezra Miller? Would they have kept Gal Gadot or, or Momoa or any of these other people? Right. They're keeping a lot of what Snyder set up, including, like you said, those three major linchpins in the universe. We've got Jason Momoa as Aquaman, Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, and Ezra Miller as The Flash. Those remain consistent. Those were Snyder's choices. The fact that they're going to continue forward means that, guess what? The Snyder films still count. You've got a Batman, Ben Affleck, who wants to be done. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. He wants to be done. He said when he stepped down, he said he was looking for a uh, graceful way to exit the role. He decided the Flash is that graceful way to exit the role. He doesn't want to do anymore. He said it a hundred times. It doesn't mean the fans want to believe him. They don't. But he said it a hundred times. He's done with it. So now you're in a situation where you're like, oh, our, our in continuity Batman is done. What do we do? We we don't just recast it and say it's the same person. I mean, I guess you could. You don't cast another young one because now you've got confusion in the marketplace with Robert Pattinson. So the solution is you bring in Michael Keaton as an elder statesman Batman who can then be the mentor figure for the, for the in-continuity universe moving forward. That's a solution. You might not agree with that solution, but I understand the rationale of that solution. Makes sense to me. So it allows you to have two Batmen that are very different, that there won't be confusion. The Cavill situation, we don't truly know the truth of that, but by all accounts, it is part WB's fault, but it's also part Cavill's fault. And that's I was just getting ready to tack that on to the end of whatever you were going to say. I mean, for all the people that are mad at WB about how Cavill was treated, we don't know how much of this is his or his agents doing too. We don't know, but... Here's what we, we've known for a while now, is for a couple of years now, what, three years, he says he'd love to do more Superman, and that's it. There's been no movement on him actually doing it. Now, I, I agree with the people who says he's a great Superman, and I'd love to see him more as Superman, 100%. I agree. He'd be great. But there's been no indication that he was going to continue as Superman other than his very vague comments that he would like to. So again, it shouldn't be a shock that he's not going to be Superman anymore. The writing's been on the wall for years now. And you might not agree with it, but we knew it. So let's not pretend that this is a surprise. Was it a confirmation or just some kind of a a backyard rumor that uh, he was ready to go for the uh, post-credit scene in Shazam, but he priced himself out of doing it? It was a rumor. I don't know how true it is. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. That do- that doesn't seem like it's out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. And, and he's s- keeping himself busy doing plenty of other stuff right now. So it's not like he's just hanging out going, God, I wish WB would call me like SpongeBob in the coffee shop or anything. Yeah. But yeah. It's- and so while I agree with all the fans who's like, no, bring Henry Cavill back. He's he shouldn't be done. I agree with that. One hundred percent. I think so. But at this point, it's become pretty evident over the past few years that that's not the way it's going. So I think that, again, using Supergirl in the meantime, before they recast, before they launch another Superman thing, I mean, that's that's a solution. And the, the possibilities in doing it this way could go on. I mean, assuming they're well-received and successful and what have you, it, it opens up so many doors. Like, I've, I've thought for a little while now, it would be nice if they would reboot it with a bunch of younger, you know, 25 to 30 year olds being your justice league. Mm -hmm. Well, this Supergirl and this Batgirl kind of fit that mold. And it's not like they can't get a aqua lad out of it. Uh, you know, Zachary Levi, he's getting up there in age, I guess. you know, he's probably late thirties, early forties by now. But yeah, my, my point is yet you have to have some youth injected into this here periodically. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not to make the obvious comparison or to get anything started, but this is part of the reason why Marvel needed to let go with Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is what, 60 years old? I don't know. 
Sure. I mean, thereabouts. I mean, how long can he keep going on being a superhero in a movie like that? You know? Yeah. They they just had to find a way to redo things. So, you know, they're they're kind of revamping things on that end with you know bringing in some new blood with Shang Chi and Moon Knight and all these other ones and you know uh, Brie Larson's obviously significantly younger than Robert Downey Jr. You know, Chris Evans kind of bailed on it for whatever reason. So, I mean, that's they're kind of doing the same thing over on that end of the the playground that that DC's doing here. They're they're injecting some youth and some freshness into it, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Also, I feel like again, if we have an older mentor Batman in Michael Keaton, it also makes sense that he would have Batgirl as the boots on the ground while he's in the Batcave. I mean, I kind of like that idea. I yeah, mean, I mean, you kind of exactly... get yeah, you kind of get to eat your cake. Wait, have your cake and eat it too. Yes, you kind of right. get to do that. I don't, I don't want to turn it into full blown Batman Beyond levels, but you know, I, I kind of get doing it that way. It, it makes sense. And you know, I'm sure there's there's purists out there that would say, you know, Batgirl is not a subservient to Batman like a Robin or something like that. She's a little bit more independent, or she's more of a a focal point as Oracle helping the Bat family out. Like she's never been a yes sir, no sir to Batman. She's more of a, a you know, almost level ally to him. But the, this, this is a plan that if handled correctly, I think works and works well. Yeah. So anyway, all that is to say, like this is a way of going forward. But if they were truly erasing the Snyder movies, which I don't believe they are, you wouldn't have half of the the in continuity folks still carrying over from Zack Snyder's Justice League. Um and then so I'm not all that worried about it. Again, it's uh, most of it is stuff we've already heard or speculated at least one way or another. And so now we have to wait and see what the execution of that is. So I just don't understand the panic, but it it wouldn't be a week in DC fandom without some sort of panic or anger and fighting and and I've stayed out of it online, but I wanted to say my piece here of like, I don't think it's that big a deal, especially because most of it is stuff we already figured was happening anyway. Um, Shazam showing up, maybe, maybe not. Again, who knows? Uh, I'd, I'd prefer it if he did, honestly. Yeah, I mean, again, if we're, if we are setting the new status quo for, for DC on film, and so it would be nice to get many cameos and stuff but who knows david sandberg's uh notes like you said he might just be messing with people but it implies to me that maybe not uh but anyway i didn't lose my mind he's a cheeky fellow i don't know if you can trust it exactly so and again, to go back to my other point, I don't think Ben Affleck would have said yes, because at that point he was already ready to be done. Um, but they got him back one more time with this offer of the Flash, and I don't think he would have done it if it didn't honor what came before, and then if he didn't feel it was a good way to say goodbye. And he said so himself a few days later. So he was out there promoting his new film, The Tender Bar, uh, and of course, they asked him about Batman. Of course they did, because of it's course exactly related to that film. Uh, so this is, comes from the Herald Sun. It says, I've never said this. This is hot off the presses. But maybe my favorite scenes in terms of Batman and the interpretation of Batman that I have done were in the Flash movie. I hope they maintain the integrity of what we did because I thought it was great and really interesting. Different, but not in a way that is incongruent with the character. Who knows? Maybe they'll decide it doesn't work, but when I went and did it, it was really fun and really, really satisfying and encouraging, and I thought, wow, I think I have finally figured it out. He did also reiterate that The Flash will bring his career as Batman to a close. And he said he called it a really nice finish on my experience with that character. I ain't going to lie. That may be just a little sad hearing it. Of course. But I mean, it's it's not unexpected. But at the same time, you always just hold that little bit of hope that something's going to happen. But I mean, and that's course, just, and, and that's just how many it. times has Hans Zimmer retired from doing superhero movie scores? So I mean, uh, if I want to, you know, rekindle the flame, I can talk about that now, right? Sure, but that's just it. I, as a fan of Ben Affleck, as a fan of his version of Batman, of course, I would have loved to have seen more of him. 
much like Cavill. But realistically speaking, we knew we we've known he's wanted to be done for a while. He has said it countless times. At a certain point, you go, you know what? I'm happy and grateful for the time we had. And yeah, maybe like Michael Keaton in 20 years, he comes back for some random thing or shit. Who knows? You never know. Like, sure, anything could happen. But for now, I'm taking him at his word. The Flash is his goodbye. I'm going to enjoy this last hurrah. And I hope that he's right, that it's a really satisfying finish. And that that feels pretty definitive. That's not him dancing around a question and giving a really vague answer that's open to interpretation there. That's that's pretty much the, you know, the gavel coming down on it right there. Yeah. Just as an example, for those that may not know what I'm talking about, when somebody asked him if he was going to, you know, be Matt Reeves Batman. And he said something to the effect of, are you kidding me? I'd be an ape on the ground for Matt Reeves. He never said yes. Yeah. He just, he danced around it very tactfully. Yep. Oh, I remember. That was a Comic-Con. I remember. I remember the debates after people saying, no, he said he'd be an ape on the ground. Yeah, but he never said he was doing the movie. Yep. This, this is not that kind of an answer. This, this feels very shut the book. It's good. Yeah. Um, and I do, it, but you like, you feel that he's still burnt by the justice league experience because the way he's like, as long as they maintain the integrity of what we did, as long as they don't change it after the fact, you know, like justice league. <laughs> so I, I did take some pe- you know, I saw some people being like, Oh, well, what's he saying? Are they going to change it? I think that he's just, after the experience with justice league, he's just a little gun shy of being like, Hey, what I shot was great. I hope that's what ends up in the movie. So it's, I mean, it's nice to hear how happy he was with what they did for the flash. Like that's very cool. That's encouraging. And I'm, I can't wait to see what that is. Um, but yeah, of course you're sad to, to know that, you know, that'll be it. But I, I hope if he's happy with the ending, I hope we as fans are as well. I will certainly agree to that. So, it, I, and what's funny is because this was just a few days after the whole brouhaha about the Flash, it almost seems like he's like, you know what, I sh- I'm going to say more than I normally would because of that drama. Makes sense. That's what it feels like to me. But, yeah. I, I don't know how much he pays attention to online uproar no idea but it just felt like interesting timing that there was all the drama about the rumors about the flash erasing the snyderverse and then a few days later ben affleck's doing an interview and and says hey this is some of the best batman material i've ever done and it was a great way it was a really nice finish in my experience with batman does seem a little convenient doesn't it yeah but good to hear nonetheless And, and it's almost like he's like oh do i have to say i'm done again Okay, I'll say it again. So there you go. We'll find out November fourth. Still on the still on the release date for November fourth. That feels like a long time, but as quick as the last couple of years have gone, maybe not. Yeah, I think it's gonna go quick. Uh, anyway, that's what I got for news. There were a couple like new images from the Batman. There was one of uh, Robert Pattinson, like just in the suit and then there was one of him and uh catwoman on top of the roof which it's very much the same scene from the trailer none of them were particularly revealing they were just still images of stuff we've pretty much seen so i don't know if there's much to discuss other than that's what they are yeah nothing no i haven't seen them i don't know what you're talking about that's okay uh anything i'm forgetting that you that you can think of uh no because i'm really out of the news loop right now that's all right All right. Uh, That's okay. Well, that's what we got for news for this week. It ain't bad. Um, But uh, before we get to the Wayne Manor mailbox, I've mentioned on a couple episodes now that we've got a new member to the podcast family, Fan Fatals. And uh, Gabby and Emma have recorded a little promo, so I want to share that with you guys if you're looking for something else to listen to. So here we go. Take it away, Gabby and Emma. Hi, I'm Gabby. And I'm Emma, and we're the hosts of the newest Real Fans Network show, Fan Fatales. We talk about all sorts of fandom-based topics, especially Harry Potter, Disney, Star Wars, and more. And we don't just talk about them. We share our own stories about our experiences. Or we have a fun conversation that we'd love for you to join in on. We release episodes every Wednesday wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow us on Instagram at FanFatalesPod, which is F-A-N-F-A-T-A-L-E-S-P-O-D. 
pod to get the latest updates, stories, or vlogs. We are so grateful to be joining the RF4RM network. And we can't wait to make new friends with you all. See you real soon. Bye. Bye. So there you have it. Check out Fan Fatales wherever you get your podcasts or go to rf4rm.com and uh, give it a listen. Uh, but before we get to the Wayne Manor mailbox, I forgot we're also going to do another Batman Beyond. So here we go. We watch the next episode of Batman Beyond. Guess what, Jamie? We're in season three. Home stretch, baby. We are so close. So we watched season three, episode one, King's Ransom. This was directed by Butch Lukic and written by Rich Fogel. It aired on September 16th of 2000. And now, Jamie, now the Royal Flush Gang is back. Thank goodness. But, I, I missed them. But they're a mess. They, they, they seem to be having some internal struggles. They're having a hard time. <laughs> they're having a bad year. Um, so yeah, Ten's gone, right? She's moved on. Yep. And Ace, uh, their Ace, is, you know, barely surviving. Because Ace, I guess, is a robot, android, something like that. Sounds about right, I guess. Uh, and so they're out. They're doing this job. They're stealing some priceless cat. You would think for uh, the Batman Beyond version of Catwoman. But no, it is for Paxton Powers, who we have not seen in ages. So it was uh, Derek Powers' son, who now uh, runs the, the company with Bruce Wayne. So he has them out stealing priceless things from him. He's got his own little collection of priceless museum items. and uh, But when they're stealing this cat, Batman intervenes. The cat's little ear gets broken. And so Paxton's like, well, I'm not paying you what I said, but here's a little something for your trouble. And they're just not going well. And then Jack gets captured in this whole thing. So they're not going to save Jack. He's in jail. And so they decide, well, then we're going to just take Paxton and we're going to hold him for ransom. Uh, And they call Bruce Wayne and they're like, we got your CEO. You're going to pay us. And Bruce Wayne's like, nah, I ain't paying for that guy. Which is like the best part of the whole episode, in my opinion. It's pretty good. It's really good. Where he's like, he's like, nope, the answer is no. We don't uh, negotiate with terrorists. So best of luck. Uh, And so they're like, well, crap. Now what do we do? And the king and queen, they're having their own little struggles. They're having problems. And I guess, you know, the king, he's having a hard time because she keeps being like, oh, well, when my father was in charge, when my father was in charge. And so he's feeling bad about it. Um, Paxton has a, he has like his own mercy graves. I thought the exact same thing. That's weird that you say that. I was like, yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, like a pretty young thing, female, who also happens to kick ass and be his bodyguard. Uh, So anyway, they're like, okay, well, that instead, Paxton has this priceless crown. Bruce Wayne, go get the crown for us. And then, you know, we'll, we'll set Paxton free. And then they decide, or... We just kill Bruce Wayne and then Paxton will give us whatever he wants. So it's like a, a double cross on top of double cross on top of double cross. Um, but they try to take down Bruce Wayne. He and Batman are ready. Uh, there's another big brouhaha. They fight. Batman, uh, Terry Batman fights Ace. Uh, Bruce is sort of just recovering. Uh, then Ace the Bat Hound comes to his res- rescue and takes out King. Uh, in the end, they stop both Paxton and the Royal Flush Gang. Uh, the King lets the Queen get captured as well. And then we find out he had been working with, well, her name's not Mercy, but essentially Mercy Paxton's bodyguard the whole time. Because now that they had the uh, info to Paxton safe, they went in and they cleaned it out uh, just in time for the Queen to escape, get her revenge on the King, and then Batman stops them all. Uh, in the meantime, Ten is out doing her thing, trying to live the best life, and she bails out Jack and is trying to get him basically on her path to to give up crime and, and live an honest life. Uh, so that's King's Ransom. What'd you think, Jamie? Uh, started off a little shaky for me. It, it felt like it was going to be another 
ho-hum, run-of-the-mill episode that I was going to be like, yeah, whatever, I watched this. But it, it kind of picked up steam as it went along. And and I don't think even the finished result was necessarily great, but I, I enjoyed it well enough. I think it was a good episode. I think it was worth watching. Uh, I especially liked, you know, Bruce's involvement in an action scene because it, it felt to me like I was seeing Batman doing something instead of Terry Batman doing something. Um, I love seeing Ace get in on the action. I think that was probably my favorite part of the episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the little bit of the twist with King working with uh, Paxton's assistant I thought was a nice touch because that was really the point that woke me up going, oh, this isn't going to just be standard fare here. Mm. Um, you know, I've probably seen the same thing done better elsewhere. It's not, you know, an amazing achievement, but just, just enough to perk my ears up and really make me pay attention for the rest of the episode. And I, and I must say I do like how Jack is doing the uh, the Vincent Gambino thing of, they threw me in jail. Just let me get some sleep now. From my cousin Vinny, you ever seen? Oh that? God, I, it's been ages. Sorry, <laughs> I just watched it yesterday. I love that movie. But anyway, uh, he's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to get out of here. I just let me go get some rest." But uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a pretty good episode. Okay, I really liked it. I thought it was really good. And what I liked about it is, you know, we had we had gotten some very random ones. Uh, in season two and some worked and some less so. Um, but what I liked is this felt like a, almost a back, a return to form for like a very traditional Batman story where an old, an old enemy is back. Things have changed. Things are a little different. And it not only ties in the Royal flush gang. So there's some continuity there with the previous stories with them, with 10 and how that was left. Even to the point where we get a callback. Cause if you remember the last time we saw them, you know, she and Terry had this, this, romance and she left a note for him and he eventually like throws it away he doesn't even read it and he or she even asks about it so like i like that continuity but not only does it include them and carries on that story that it's been a long time i don't even remember when that was but also to bring back in the powers family who i had almost forgotten about at this point um and wrap it all up in a really interesting story that i was very invested in uh yeah, I was actually really impressed. And then, like you said, the the twist with the bodyguard, I didn't see coming, and I thought that was very cool, too. So, yeah, it just felt like a good, strong Batman adventure that was Batman Beyond, and it picked up some characters and some plot points that it has been a long time since we've seen. So, yeah, I really like this one. Sounds like we're pretty much on the same page here. Uh, yeah, like I said, my favorite part is when they call Bruce Wayne and try to get Ransom, and he's just like, nope, not going to happen. <laughs> so yep. <laughs> it was great. That was a good Bruce moment. I like that. Uh, and, and I, I just, I liked how he handled himself in that situation. Like clearly he's, you know, aged out of the fact where he can stand toe to toe with, you know, four supervillains at one or anything, but he, he still has his capacities mentally. Like I, I know I can't beat these people with my fists necessarily, but I can outsmart them, you know, like leaving the jacket underwater to look like a silhouette of him laying there just enough to get it as a distraction to, to, you know, hit him from the side or throwing the cane at, at, I think it was queen as she was coming at him or whistling for ACE to come out of the car and help him deal with King. I mean, it, th these were good moments for Bruce in this, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Was, and yeah, like you said, it's nice to see him out of the bat cave for once. Uh, we also get the return of Barbara Gordon. I feel like it's been a long time since we've seen her. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, though, her voice changed. I looked at the actress who played her and I went, huh, I don't remember her playing Barbara Gordon. Because didn't it used to be uh, Stocker Channing? That sounds right. And this time it was Angie Harmon. OK, because I looked at it, and I go, I don't remember seeing Angie Harmon's name in the credits previously. Yeah, maybe it's just been a while or something like that. But and, and I'm sure we probably brought it up on previous episodes. We had to have. But. King and Queen, the voices for King and Queen. Yeah. The King was George Lazenby and the Queen was Sarah Douglas. Yeah, I did yes. check that because I remember them from the last time and I checked to make sure it was still them and it was still them. Pretty cool. Nod, yeah, that. very cool. In fact, I think you even had to point out to me on one of the episodes who Sarah Douglas was because I didn't know her by name at that point. Yeah, Ursa. Love me some Ursa. Don't we all? Yeah. Um, I will say that I, there, I I agree with you. I love that Ace was involved. I think it was a slight missed opportunity to have Ace versus Ace. Well, I mean, you you did have the, 
I, for a second there, I thought this episode might have been written by Tim Rooney because of all of the card puns that are sprinkled. <laughs> yeah. Thing. Like there's a moment where they exchange like three or four right on top of each other. It's like, guys, stop. Come on. I get enough of this in messenger chat every day. Okay? <laughs> but uh, uh, the thing I, I, the one that I did like was like Terry said something about them having an ace in the up there. Sleeve ace in the, yeah. Like, they had an ace and in he the hole says, so did I. Yeah. I, I, I like that one. I like that one a lot. Yeah. So yeah, I, I thought this was a really good one. Uh, what would you give it for a letter grade? I think I'm at a B plus with this one. All right. Well, you know what I'm going to do? A minus. A minus. <laughs> <laughs> but I swear to you, before you said that, I, w- I was like vacillating between B plus and A minus. I was like, oh, but I'm like, no, this is a really good one. I'm I'm going high. A minus for this one. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's, that's pretty close, I think. All right. Well, there you go. That's King's Ransom. Uh, next time up is Untouchable. And also, just FYI, we're getting very close to the Out of the Past episode, which... That'll be fun. That's the one everybody says that I'm going to love. Right? I mean, it's written by Paul Dini, so. Oh, well. There's a, yeah, there's a couple good ones coming up. Um, anyway, but next one, Untouchable. I have no idea if it's a good one. I don't remember it. Uh, but we're getting real close, so that is fun. But now, now is the time. We're going to check in with you fine feathered finks and crack open the Wayne Manor mailbox. It's time again for You've got mail. Maybe temporary. She wrote a letter. You're one hell of a messenger. This is all master Wayne. All right, here we go. This message comes from our old pal Muhammad. I don't say his last name anymore because he told me I said it wrong. I said it was Jafar. It's spelled like Jafar, but he he said that's not how you say it. I don't know how else you would say it. Uh, Anyway, (laughs) uh, he says, oh, he signed it a deal. So maybe maybe he was talking about I shouldn't call him Muhammad. I don't know. What do I call you, Muhammad? Did I call you a deal? I'm calling you a deal. It says, hey guys, happy new year. May your fill, may your year be filled with joy and happiness. I'm kind of sad that Andy hates January because it's my favorite month of the year. Oh well. However, regarding the DCEU, uh, one day into 2022 and we've already got drama. I'm pretty sure you've learned of it by now, uh, but here are my feelings. Uh, it's, it can be summarized by this analogy. Your favorite sports team, the DCEU, after years of success, is facing a crisis and the board managing the team makes disastrous decisions which alienate the fans and the players, which forces the club into financial crisis and is forced to sell their best assets and doing a hard reboot while having mixed reception and we as the fans have to sit through it. Uh, at this point, the only th- the only thing I wish is the next person who's going to chair the DCEU is a fan and makes good decisions. I'm just tired. Sorry for the long rant. Have a gr- great year. P.S. As an adult to nie- or as an uncle to nieces, God, my brain. It's morning. Uh, as an uncle to nieces, they're the best to be around. Congrats to you and your wife, Andy. Uh, thanks, Adil. Okay, so. Uh, first thing is, um, yeah, I don't remember when I said I hate January, but yeah, like it's just so sad because it's like the magic of Christmas just disappears and January is just meh and we're so far away from the holidays again. Yeah. January is just that month where I try to find reasons not to go outdoors. Yeah. It's just January is just blah. I'm glad it's your favorite, but it maybe it's your birthday or something. I don't know. The week of Christmas here, it was in like the mid fifties. Ah. The first week in January, single digits. So, yeah, forgive me if I'm not exactly crazy about January myself. Um, anyway, uh, as for your analogy about the DCEU, I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's entirely apt uh, because there have been mixed receptions the whole time. And that's the part that I think a lot of fans don't want to acknowledge or pretend isn't real. And that's why there's been just just this constant swirl. Like you, I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing the fighting about it. I don't want to take part in the fighting about it. Uh, I'm excited for the slate that's coming. And so that's what I'm focused on is excited about the stuff that's coming our way. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. 
a, a focus on positivity is positive mental health. I mean, I, I don't know a better way to say it than that. I mean, I, I try to steer myself away from the negativity that I kept seeing online and I'm, I'm a happier person because of it. And you're exactly right there. There's been so much defensive. Ugh, I, now I can't talk. Thanks. You passed it to me. It's contagious. So, so much divisiveness in this universe for, you know, since 2013. I yeah. Mean, since 2013. That movie was so divisive in and of itself. How could everything that followed it not be? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I, I still think Man of Steel is, if not the best, the second best movie in the entire DCEU. I, I still go back and forth between it and Zack Snyder's Justice League over which one's the best right now. But uh, it, it's... WB is still trying to find that balance of overall audience satisfaction and I, I guess I can't blame them for making these attempts to to solidify that fan base a little bit more yeah and 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 because it's been so divided since 2013 it's like they can't win and I think that's the struggle is is no matter what there's a group of the fans that say they're doing it wrong and it's just, it's a crappy situation to be in yeah uh and like I said I just uh I just don't want to fight about it. This is supposed to be fun. Exactly. Superhero mm -hmm. movies are supposed to be fun. Arguing with people over this kind of stuff is just silliness. Yeah. Um, all right. Next message is from Weston Craig. It says, hey, guys, I had never heard of Paul Dano before, uh, but if you haven't checked out the movie There Will Be Blood, he's great in it. How do you feel about the Legion of Superheroes? Have you tried Tom Taylor? tom taylor's nightwing yet also can anyone on the podcast or listening figure out what naomi's powers are all i can tell is that she can fly and create light but what does the light actually do thanks weston um thank you weston um i i had heard of paul dano before i have seen there will be blood um but again i go back to prisoners as like if you want to if you want a taste of what his riddler could be check out prisoners but no he's been a great actor for a long time and oh my god there was was he in Little Miss Sunshine? Is that what I'm thinking of? Maybe. I saw that once. and uh, the, the only thing I remember about that is Steve Carell and Arkin. Yeah, same. That's why I'm like, I'm like, but I feel like he was in it too. But no, I mean, I've been aware of Paul Dano for a oh, long time. Oh, Tony Collette. I, I, I should, I, she's one of my favorite actresses. I, yeah. I should obviously mention her name out loud as well because she's great. She is. Um, but no, he's, he, and he's been like this great respected actor for a lot of years now and he's never done any like big blockbuster type movie this is sort of his first one so it will be very interesting i'm i'm certainly intrigued by his performance in the movie i i certainly agree with that the the only thing that i can recall that i've seen him in for sure is prisoners and you know copy and paste everything you said there um i own there will be blood because i bought it as part of some package of like oscar dramas or something like that i don't remember it was like five movies for 15 bucks or something like that. And that was in it. And I just, I still haven't watched it yet, even though everybody keeps telling me I should. I didn't like it, but to each their it's, own. It's Paul Thomas Anderson, right? Yeah. So that's going to, his, his stuff doesn't automatically work for me. And I know he's got a lot of his fans where they love everything he does. I, I ain't one of them. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens when I get there. But I respected the performances. Um, but yeah, it, I, it just, for me, it just, it, it's so long. Um, all right. And then here's some other questions. Legion of superheroes. Have you read Tom Taylor's Nightwing? And uh, can you figure out what Naomi's powers are? Jamie? Legion of superheroes. I, I don't have a great deal of knowledge or experience with them. I'm somewhat aware of them, but I'm not sure I could name more than like one or two of them by name. So I, I guess that's all I got to say about that. Uh, Tom Taylor's Nightwing. I have not checked it out. Uh, Tom Taylor is a great writer. I love all of his work that I have read. So I imagine it's probably pretty good, but I don't know for sure because I have not experienced it for myself. And Naomi, I read the first couple of issues of her comic book series. And I don't remember a doggone thing about it, except she was trying to like discover her identity as far as like who her real parents were or something like that. I don't I don't even think her powers have been revealed to that point as I was reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, same Legion of Superheroes. I, I have a passing knowledge of them and I like them fine, but I they've never been like my favorite. 
Uh, I did like the animated series that they made many years ago. It was actually pretty good. Tom Taylor's Nightwing, I have not read it, but I have heard nothing but great things. So I should actually add it to my list on DC Universe Infinite because I think, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be really good. And then, yes, yeah, Naomi, I know nothing about Naomi. Nothing. Never read a single panel, so... We'll find out when the show comes out. I'm hoping it'll do a good job of explaining it for all of us. Uh, all right. Uh, we have, uh, isn't it? We got two messages that are very similar. Um, so <laughs> they're both about the cowl in the Batman. Because on the uh, trailer reaction, uh, Brendan said that the cowl looks like it's made out of craft singles. <laughs> And uh, I go, yeah, it looks like it's made out of cheese. And so uh, first one's from James Mullins. And he said, what are craft singles made of in Australia? Is, is kangaroo milk black? <laughs> uh, and then Christine Cox says, hey, guys, I very much enjoyed your podcast on the Batman trailer. It's one of my most anticipated movies. But I got to say, uh, the cowl looks like it's made of cheese. I couldn't disagree more. But you guys made me laugh. So thanks for that. I'll be interested to see what you think about the actual movie, Chris. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, James. Um, I think it's obvious that if you were to dye cheese black and carve a cowl out of it, it would look like the one in the Batman. I, I mean, I wasn't involved there, so I just throw my my post thoughts in here for my two cents worth. Uh, I don't like craft singles either. I don't either, <laughs> if I'm being honest, but not because they look like the Batman cowl, just because they, they don't taste like anything. I'm, I'm just saying I, they're it, it's an apt comparison because I don't like either one. <laughs> All right. Nice. Uh, I mean, I think we said it initially, too, is is that's how we think it looks. Obviously, not everyone agrees. And that's OK, because, yeah, there are a lot of people out there who call it the best looking Batman cowl they've ever seen. So but listen, it, it's, your mileage uh, may vary. I'm not crazy about how the costumes look in the Dark Knight trilogy either, or the cowls or anything else. I mean, they're, they're fine. I don't have a real issue with them, but I don't look at them going, God, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So that's not the most important thing I'm looking for in a Batman movie, but it does help. I'm just saying. It like doesn't the hurt. Affleck cowl, the Affleck cowl, that is a thing of beauty. Masterpiece. As as I'm yep. 100%. All right. So thanks, guys. And thanks for being good sports about the comment. I'll also say that. Um, all right. Next email is from Rody. It says, hey, Batcast family. First of all, congratulations on all the excitement over the past year. I'm excited for you and Brendan to be entering the wonderful world of fatherhood. It's the absolute best thing ever, and you're going to love it. Anyway, I have a ridiculous but hopefully fun question. If you somehow met a person who had no knowledge of Batman, and you were feeling mischievous, what two movies would you show them back to back to thoroughly confuse them? Any two movies, live action or not, it just has to be two movies featuring Bruce Wayne as Batman. Thanks, Rhodey. Thanks, Rhodey. Thank you for the congratulations. We are now four weeks away from Baby Watch, and I I can't believe it. Kind I'm telling of- you. Freaked out. Have her hold on till toward the more the end of February. I'm just saying. Okay. Well, either that or shoot for Valentine's Day because that'll land smack dab between my wife's is the seventh and the twenty first. If she lands on the fourteenth, we'll have a nice synergy going there. All right, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I we're hoping sooner than later. <laughs> Because Catherine's reached that point where she's like, I'm so tired of being pregnant. Oh, it's yep. She's believe me. I remember that well from both times around. I, I know she's exactly at that moment where it's like, I just want to be done. Yeah. yeah. And and we're like, but we get to do this again. At least that's the plan. <laughs> we, Sweet. We do want another, but that's easy to say because we haven't dealt with the first one yet. Yeah, for the first couple months, I wouldn't even bring up the conversation about it. But yeah, it's I, I definitely agree with the first thing that this uh, this emailer said. That it's fatherhood is the most amazing and rewarding thing you're going to do in your entire life, my friend. That's good. I mean, I'm very excited. It's funny. I was talking to a, an old colleague uh, the other day and he he said he said, just remember, Andy, you know, you'll be standing there over the crib and this baby will be crying and you won't know what the hell to do. There's nothing wrong and it won't stop crying. Just remember that about two weeks from then, they'll be asking you for the car keys. It goes that fast. 
It's it sure seems that way. Okay, I'm just going to throw another side note in there. Last week, I was picking up my daughters from school, and of course, they're in the process of of getting their log entries for their driver's license because they have to have 50 hours log to get their their driver's licenses, which is really fun trying to get a hundred hours of driving done since I have two at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we were switching seats in the car, like they were walking over from the school, and I got out of the driver's seat and moved to the passenger seat, and. One of my daughters got in the back seat and the other in the driver's seat. And I caught a truck with three guys in it with the windows rolled down, leaning out, staring at my daughter. I did not <laughs> like that. Oh, I was no. not ready for that. <laughs> oh, that oh, did not no. sit well with me at all. But I mean, she, she's 16. She's developing into a, both of them, developing into young ladies. And it's 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 going to be a struggle. But uh it's great. I, I love being a dad. I truly do. That's good. My uh, my brother in law Ray, uh, you know, and my niece Esri. My niece Esri, she's nine now, and I, I, you know, and I'm of course I'm biased, but I think she's she's a beautiful kid. She really is. And yeah, a couple of years ago, um, she like got her pictures done, and we were hanging out at my sister's place, and uh, my friend Dillup was was like, oh, that's a great picture of Esri and Ray. Her father went. Yeah, she's kind of pretty. I think I might have to invest in a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my favorite thing ever for fatherly advice. I think it was Bill Engvall, the, the comedian, that said it. He's like, you know, the easiest way to deal with dating, shoot the first one. Word will get around to the rest. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, fatherhood is coming. God bless. Um, anyway, so two Batman movies to thoroughly confuse people. That's the easiest question I'm going to answer all day. Batman 66 and BVS. Oh, all right. That works. I, I, I have the same mindset, but I was going to say Batman and Robin and the Dark Knight. That, that'll that get about equal reactions of what the hell. Yeah. Just trying to think of the two most tonally inconsistent versions. That's exactly what I went with as well. That's why I chose those two. So, yeah, same same page. I mean, we, have, we haven't seen the Batman yet, but I might even... You know, like based on what we're seeing, I would go with like Batman 66 and the Batman because that even feels like a bigger gap at this point. It could be. We'll find out in about two months, I guess. But I felt like that wasn't fair because we haven't actually seen the movie yet. True enough. Um, all right. Next message is from our pal Mark Bickford. It says, hey, guys, all the buzz around the Batgirl movie rumors this afternoon reminded me of something I've been meaning to send you. There are rumors or at least speculation around the second Barry in the Flash movie becoming the reverse Flash. It struck me at the time. If that's the case, they put it right in front of us. Uh, doesn't seem like exactly the sort of thing Andy Muschietti would do. Give us the answer in a way that most people wouldn't notice it. Thanks and take care, Mark. Um, I mean, I think we have talked about that at some point, right? I think I mentioned it because I didn't know there were any rumors around it. And I said that I, my shot to be called was that the second Barry was going to be the reverse. Form. Yeah. Like I said, I feel like we, we did talk about that. And then once we saw the two berries in the teaser, um, and that one of them is wearing the old Batman costume with the flash symbol spray painted on, it's like, well, you know, for a while before the movie finished production a lot of people would say like we don't even know who the villain is yet and it's like well maybe that's because it is also ezra miller as reverse flash so it's been discussed it does seem very likely um but and, yeah and keep in mind how how many people going into this movie are going to be you know flash historians yeah that, that know this kind of stuff or that maybe have even seen the tv series or anything like that I mean, you, you've got to figure they're making this for the masses, not for the DC fans. So this could be a complete shock to your general audience moviegoer. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I I agree it seems likely, but uh, is it is it surprising they would put it right out there? I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if they've really put it right out there. It's not like they've said it, but the clues are certainly there. But again, it's really only for us nerds who have been following this, you know, who follow everything. Or maybe they're going to do to us what Marvel does. I mean, how many times have the Marvel fans gotten into their groups and talked about Mephisto showed up here, Mephisto showed up there. <laughs> Still no Mephisto. The answer We're, is always however, Mephisto. However many years and 27 movies or five TV shows, whatever it is, not a peep out of Mephisto yet. But every single time something comes up, everybody's always like, that's Mephisto. Definitely. 
Like, I, I went into Spider-Man No Way Home fully expecting Mephisto to pop up in there somewhere because it's essentially a sideways twist on a story that happened between Spider-Man and Mephisto. So. Oh, but no, well. still not there. No, no Mephisto. Oh, but we kind of glazed over it. But he said, you know, the, the rumors about the Batgirl movie and then with the rumors of the Flash movie is the fact that Black Canary is involved. There have been rumors that Black Canary is in the Batgirl movie to help. I assume s- that means Journey Smollett. Yes. Yes. To, to set up then the Black Canary movie um, and the fact that she could also show up in The Flash. I just, it's all rumor. At this point, anyone could show up in The Flash is kind of the, the blanket statement. But I love that we're going back to Journey Smollett Bell. I thought she was so great as Black Canary. She was so well cast. I was very happy with her portrayal and I wanted to see more. I love that we are getting more, um, even if it is just the, the solo film. But if they're going to use Batgirl to set that up and or The Flash to set that up, the more Journey Smollett Bell is Black Canary, the better as far as I'm concerned. So I'm here for it. So let me get this straight. We potentially have Black Canary, Batgirl, Supergirl, and Wonder Woman in this movie. Yeah. And we're talking about formulating possibly a new Justice League at the end of it. Yeah. I can only imagine what the asshat anti-woke crowd is saying about this in social media. Uh, Yep, you are correct. I don't even want to address it any further. I'm just going to say life is too short to be that kind of a mindset about something like this, especially. Yep. I love all those characters, so I'm all for it. I'm I'm in there. I'm in there like swimwear. I'm I'm all for it. Um. All right. One last you, email you, here. You give Michael oh. Michael Keaton a a uh, what, what do you call it uh, a gender switch surgery in the middle of the movie, and I'm cool with it. I'm there. <laughs> and I don't even care if that shit doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Anyway. All right. Uh, one last email here is from our old pal Stuart from Gear and Z. It says, hey, guys, first of all, uh, I want to say I couldn't believe the response you got from some toxic listeners regarding us or regarding you telling us that you're bisexual. When I heard you say that, my stomach actually sank and I felt sick from it. I honestly don't know why people would have such a problem with how other people live their lives if it isn't harming them or anyone else. Surely their negative thoughts and behavior should be directed at people who actually do cause harm and hurt people rather than those wanting to truly be themselves i'd love to actually see if these people have the balls to say it to your face or if they're just sad individuals with their own insecurities and misery in their own life uh, and that they have to bring others down and get some sort of satisfaction to make themselves feel better sorry to go off on this uh but people like this really get to me i'm not gay or bisexual but i'm a true believer that nobody should judge anyone for doing what makes them happy as long as they're not hurting anyone then people should be left to live their life how they want without having sad individuals bring them down for doing it uh right secondly a few years ago i was put out there to do a show ranking of all live action movies with batman in them you said you'd love to and it would be something you would like to do just before the batman was released is this something you'd still be up for doing would you let the listeners vote as well we know you love this sort of math andy (laughs) haha anyway hope you had a great christmas and new year here's to another great year of dc content stuart uh, thank you so much, Stuart. I uh, really do appreciate that. Definitely appreciate your support. Uh, like I said, on the on the year-end wrap-up, it was just a couple. It wasn't that many, you know. Um, and again, I was shockingly not as bothered about it as you would think because it, the, the level of anger and venom that these people spat at me, I was like, this doesn't even have to do with me. You know, like it, it's it was so overblown where I'm like, you you've got something going on and I hope you're OK. And, you know, just I hope those people are, are, are you know, seeking help and they're doing OK, because just that the, that level of anger just is completely was completely overblown for for what we were talking about. So, yeah, it's crazy to me, but those people are still out there. It's still a, it's still a real thing. You feel like it's 2022. Why is it? Aren't we past it? And most of us are, but yeah, there's still those people out there. What are you going to do? The quickest way to change somebody's heart about any matters like this is just having them get to know somebody who is not, uh, if they have a problem with a particular group because of race or sexuality, religion, whatever else, you need to put them together with somebody that they have the quote problem with and get them to understand people are people. The, yeah. These these ridiculous divisions amongst us, whether by church or politics or 
anything else that, that gets people's mindset against it without having ever spoken a word to a person that's of that persuasion or gender or anything else. It, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, I, I, I've talked about it briefly in the past and I don't want to get into a whole thing, but I, I used to be a racist. I, I did. And then I took a job where I had to be in a, a workplace where I was the minority, a white male was the minority in this building. And after a little while, I started to understand there's no difference between me and these other people. There's none. And I got to be friends with some of them and I got into conversations with some of them and you realize their points are valid and, and these, these differences that we have, they, they really don't mean anything, but you have to understand where the other is coming from. And it changes a person's perspective, which is why, you know, we, we, we've talked in the past about like Mel Gibson and the, and the problems that you have with him. And I don't, I feel more sorry for him than, than holding the, the difference against him. Cause I used to be like that. And I understand that a human being can change and their heart and these matters can change. So I know that there, there's hope for that going forward. But anyway, getting into a whole thing, it's this is the exposure that people need. They don't need to be inundated with the the specifics of the problems that they have. They just need to be around people that have those differences that they, for whatever reason, have the problems with to, to reach that understanding that people are people. Like Andy and I, Andy's one of my best friends. I love Andy, but I love Andy as a person. And I did well before I, I knew this revelation that he, he put on us not very long ago. And it made no difference to me because I still love Andy as a person. And that's just it. it it's, I, I'm rambling and going on. The bottom line is people need to have an understanding that people are people. I mean, that that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and to, to go to, to support that point, I mean, that's why I addressed it. That's why I put it out there is because it's really easy to hate something that's off in the distance that you know nothing about. But as soon as it is someone you know, and I feel like a lot of our listeners, you know, they feel like they know me. They've gotten to know me over the past, God, six, seven, eight years. God, it's going on eight years now. Almost nine if you count the real fan show. Yeah, going going on eight years now is like once you like once it's not this vague concept that it's easy to turn your nose up at or, 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 or you know, using ignorance to to insult it as soon as it becomes real and it's a person you do know and you actually hear that person's perspective everything changes and it won't work all the time but i mean that's you can't normalize it unless we put it out there and we talk about it and it's true for sexuality it's true for mental health like we've talked about uh it's true for race i mean the, the conversations around race in this country they've been painful and unfortunately the th the events that have sparked them is you know regrettable but at least we're talking about it because that's the only way we learn. And that's the way, you know, like that, that's why I put it out there is, is, uh, the more you learn about it, the more you talk about it, the more normal it becomes, the more you can understand it. Even if it's not your truth, even if it's not the life you're living, you understand that there are millions of other people out there who it is true for them. And you have to respect that too. Yeah. I mean, I could go on for hours with this conversation, but it's just not necessary. I just, some people would consider it a form of brainwashing or whatever, but I truly believe that exposure to the things that you fear or dislike or anything else gives you an understanding and a perspective. I, I, yeah. Anyway, I, I don't, I don't want to make it a whole thing on that. Yeah, me either. I mean, we've, we've addressed it enough, but I appreciate it. And, you know, uh, and again, I, I didn't even share it on the, the last episode as like a poor me type of thing. It was just more like, you know what, this is just the reality. The reality is 99% of the people were super supportive and sweet and wonderful about it. And then there's always a, a couple who aren't, and that's just the way it's going to be. If, if, if I could just address the thing about I wonder if they would say it to your face. Uh, no, that's that's the beauty of the Internet for so many people is the anonymity that they can get away with saying all these things without any consequence to it whatsoever. And if the me from 10 years ago can stick his head out real quick, I promise you nobody would ever say that to his face while I'm in the room. <laughs> I promise you that. Anyway, I want to be happy the rest of the day. I don't want to get into this shit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, 
leave that there. But uh, we're doing a, a a ranking of all the live action movies with Batman in them. I appreciate the reminder, Stuart. I do think that would be a lot of fun. Um, so yes, I'm keeping it on my radar. Jamie, help keep me honest. Brendan, I know you're listening. Help keep me honest. This would be really fun to do as a build up to the Batman. So I'm into it. It also requires very little homework, and I always like that too. <laughs> homework sucks uh yeah but no that i think that would be really fun and it, it is funny that like stuff like that like i feel like the listeners would enjoy it too um yeah you've already got me thinking about how i would do it but yeah it would be fun so yes let's keep it on the radar especially for a week where we're like what do we do what do we do this week um it could be really fun and i would absolutely let the listeners vote because that's part of the fun of it we would probably do our ranking but then we would we would uh, do the, the listener ranking. So thank you, Stuart. Thank you, as always, for your messages and for your support. And glad you're enjoying the show. And I'm sure we'll hear from you soon. <laughs> um, but there you go. I'm closing the Wayne Manor mailbox. Goodbye and click. Uh, so it's time to wrap up this little episode of the show. Jamie, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. As always, always fun to chat through this stuff with you. Yeah, it's, it's become something of a Sunday morning ritual for me. It's nice. It gives me something to do before football games start. So. Yeah. Forces me to not sleep away my Sunday. So, thank you? <laughs> hey, you're the one that said 9 o'clock. I'm you saying. said 9 o'clock. That was you. I said 9 o'clock because anytime I say what time, you always say 9 o'clock. And I'm like, sure. Is the, dude, I could do this at 6 o'clock because I'm always up. <laughs> well, that's that Listen, would be worse, today, wouldn't it? <laughs> today, I slept until 5.53 a.m., which is the latest I have slept in over two weeks. Okay? So, yeah, 9 o'clock is like the middle of the day for me right now. Oi, no, ma'am. I was getting up and getting my coffee and Catherine's like, are you getting up? I was like, yes, I have bat cast in a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, getting me ready for losing sleep next month. I'm, I'm just coaching you through this early fatherhood thing. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Again, my Sarah, Sarah and Ray, my sister and brother-in-law, they were like, dude, the first six months, you're just in survival mode, but you'll be all right. And then it's fine. <laughs> So may, may your next ones be twins. That's all I can say. No, <laughs> we wanted the first ones to be twins so we could just call it a day. But well, if, you know, that's the cool thing about having twins, especially if you have twins first. If you have a single after the twins, it's so much easier. It's so much easier. Like my my daughters, when they were babies, had colic at the same time. Oh, no. So in stereo screaming babies in the middle of the night and my wife breastfed both of them at the same time oh jesus and it was, this is why i love my wife is superwoman wonder woman batwoman all of it combined into one like i i have no idea how she mustered the strength to do all that she did just unbelievable you're you're gonna you're gonna see a side of Catherine in this motherhood thing that's gonna be like i loved her before but damn wow as, as this goes on trust me on this i i trust you I mean, she's been a champ up until now through the whole pregnancy. Like, she really has. So, anyway, all right, let's wrap it up, Jamie. Always a good time. People can't follow you, but they can continue tuning into the show, and they can hear you. I'm around. Here and there. You're around. Um, I already told you where to follow me, but thank you guys, as always, for joining us. Thank you for downloading the show. Please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode, and please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, there are a lot of ways to support us. You can support us on Patreon. You can send us emails. Like You can, of course, listen to the show, but the quickest and easiest and cheapest way to support us is to just leave an Apple Podcast review. It only takes a minute, and uh, yeah, the more reviews you have, the, the more you get out there. And, and that helps the show out. So thank you for that. You also could help us by going to manscaped.com and purchasing yourself some uh, some products and using the promo code BATSCAPED, B-A-T-S-C-A-P-E-D, BATSCAPED. And what's funny is that like nobody ordered anything. And then after the new year, it was like it was like people just couldn't think of it after Christmas. Now we've gotten quite a few messages from different listeners and stuff who are like, yeah, I pulled the trigger and they, they've really liked it. So yeah. Um, don't be ashamed. Get Batscape, or excuse me, get Manscaped and use Batscape, and I think you'll be happy. Uh, 
Uh, what else? Visit HolyBatCast.com. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Holy Batcast. If you've got something for the Wayne Manor mailbox, you can send that to HolyBatCast at RF4RM.com. A big thank you to Gora Venkateswar. He does our theme music. He's very talented. If you want to hear his work, you can do that at GVTunes.com. And that's it. On behalf of Jamie and Absentee Brendan, we'll miss you, buddy. Uh, Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Holy Batcast is not affiliated with Warner Brothers or DC Entertainment. The views and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. Uh, But now it's time to check in with you fine feathered finks as we crack open the Wayne Manor mailbox. We're not going to do Batman Beyond today? Oh shit, you're right.